Okay, are we ready? Okay, so I will just start again, all right? Um, first of all, um, there's a website listed over there on which you can get everything that you need for this course, including comprehensive lecture notes, slide presentation, movies, many, many things. So I'll, I will leave that on there for you to copy. And I explained that I'm going to start from zero. That means I'm not going to assume that you have any knowledge of crystallography and explain everything from the beginning and cover all of these topics by the end of the course. You should be an expert on crystallography, interpretation of diffraction patterns, uh, looking at interfaces between crystals, and so forth. And I also said that uh, you know it's your job to ask me if you don't understand anything. So feel free to interrupt during the lecture. Okay, so first of all, can somebody define for me what we mean by a crystal? Yeah, yeah. What, what is special about the atomic arrangement? Uh, <laughs> hmm? Lattice. Sorry? Lattice. It's a lattice. In other words, what does that mean in ordinary language? Array of periodic. periodic array of uh, atoms. So here, for example, is a crystalline material where you know, if I locate my origin over there, then everything that I see around there is exactly the same as over here. In other words, it really doesn't matter where I locate my origin, I will have the same pattern everywhere. Okay? So this is a, a periodic array of atoms. And this, in contrast, is what we call an amorphous material. That means there isn't any long-range order inside the material. So can you give me an example of a crystalline material and an example of an amorphous material? Diamond, Diamond is crystalline. Cri is, is what? Crystalline. crystalline, yes. And an amorphous material? Yeah, w which kind of glass? Yes, you're right. You, you mean window glass, right? Yeah. And, and of course, you can get metallic glass as well. You know, if you cool liquid metal at about a million degrees centigrade per second, or if it is uh, an alloyed material, you can cool slower, then you freeze in the structure of the liquid after the glass transition temperature, and it's an amorphous material. That means all the properties are the same in all directions. Is somebody knocking on the door? Or? No, okay. On the other hand, you see, if you look at a crystal, then the properties will be different along different directions. So you can see that the distance here is different from the distance here. Okay? That means the mechanical properties will be different in two different directions. Here, over a long range, there is no difference in the properties. So an amorphous material, we say, is isotropic, whereas a crystalline material is never isotropic. Now, does a crystal have to be solid? Do you know any liquids which are crystals? This is Korea, remember. The biggest producer of electronic devices. And all of you have your mobile phones. <laughs> yeah? Have you heard of liquid crystalline displays? LCD? Yeah. So you probably have heard of LCD, but not thought about what LCD means. So you can have order in liquids. And these are liquid crystals where the molecules are a little bit like cigars and they tend to align along certain directions. So that gives you a long range order. And in the case of liquid crystal displays, we are interested in how light goes through that liquid. So if you have them aligned, then there will be a particular plane of vibration of light that makes it through. So if I put my liquid crystal between cross polars, then I can eliminate it completely dark. Then I apply an electrical field, and the orientation of the molecules changes, and therefore light goes through. Okay? So that's how a liquid crystal display works. And if you press on a liquid crystal display, you'll see the material flow. Okay? Yep. So you don't normally do that on a display, but if you press it, 
then you will see that actually there is liquid there which is flowing. It's a very, very thin layer of liquid, and the electrical fields are very large, but because it's very thin, you can apply only a small voltage to generate a large electrical field. So anything in which there is a, a, a long-range order of atoms or molecules is a crystalline material. And of course, here we rely completely on the fact that the liquid crystal is anisotropic to make the displays. If it was isotropic, light would just go through, it doesn't matter what plane of vibration it is. Yeah? Now, um, you know, if you really understand the subject, you should be able to explain it to non-technical people, you know, members of your family if they are non-technical, and so on. And an ordinary person would immediately recognize this picture. Yeah? These are crystals, right? Why, why would the ordinary person immediately recognize those as crystals? They look beautiful, right? <laughs> yeah, they've got nice, nice facets. Yeah? And diamond would be regarded as a crystal, as you said. Uh, so these facets here are actually planes on which the crystal might break, or when it grows uh, over a very long period of time, that might be the equilibrium shape of the crystal. And they look incredibly nice. This is a picture that I took at the Raman Institute in India, where you know Raman, who was the Nobel Prize winner, he was a great collector of luminescent crystals and so forth. So you can see a lot of these uh, in the Institute. So this is what an ordinary person would regard as a crystal. And the reason why we develop facets, that means these faces on the crystal, is because it's anisotropic. Yeah. Uh, a water drop, uh, you know, if there was no gravity, it would be spherical. The same in all directions, it's isotropic. But from our point of view, you know, as engineers, scientists, uh, we are actually interested in making components out of crystals. So our definition of crystal is not that it should look uh, ordinarily beautiful. Okay. So here, for example, is a single crystal. Do you know what it is? Yeah, blade four? Yeah, for aircraft engine. And this is a single crystal grown by the thousands routinely every day. And the way you make it into a single crystal is you have this spiral at the bottom. So you start by having this as liquid inside a mold, and you withdraw it through a temperature gradient, so it's cooling from the bottom up. So you nucleate many, many crystals here. But the growth direction, the dominant growth direction, will be along here because you're withdrawing it through a temperature gradient. And only one of the crystals which is nucleated makes it through this spiral. And therefore, it acts like a seed for the rest of the blade. And why do we want to make a blade out of a single crystal? Yeah, exactly. So if we have many crystals, there will be boundaries between crystals. And those boundaries have a lot of room. And atoms can diffuse very easily. They can move between the boundaries. So during service, the blade will become longer. And that's a bad thing because it hits the casing and causes uh, a loss of efficiency. And eventually, you have to remove it from service. So to make it resistant to that extension while it is operating at temperatures, you know, the environment is about 1,400 degrees centigrade. So the metal tends to flow under stress. So by eliminating all the boundaries, you make it as a single crystal, and you get much better properties. So in the hottest part of the aircraft engine, you have single crystal blades made out of a nickel-based, what we call a super alloy. That means it's extremely strong at high temperatures. Now, of course, the, the other issue with a turbine blade is vibrations. Okay? It, it's going around uh, at about 25,000 revolutions per minute, and you can set up vibration modes. And vibration modes depend on elastic modulus, how the modulus is different in different directions. 
And I explained to you that you know, single crystals are not isotropic. So the elastic modulus is not constant. It varies with direction. So here, for example, are plots of how the elastic modulus of molybdenum, and this is silver, varies as a function of direction. So here the modulus is large, here the modulus is small. So when you grow those blades, you actually want them to grow a longer direction, which will minimize those problems associated with vibration. So it's really incredibly high technology, and it's done <coughs> as mass production. You know, if you saw this happening, you would be so impressed. So we expect the properties to be highly anisotropic. Now, the examples that I've given you of single crystals, and of course, uh, you know, in semiconductors, you grow very large silicon single crystals, and so on. And they don't look very beautiful, but they do their function. The examples that I've given you are of single crystals. And in engineering, we use very few single crystals. Most of the materials that we deal with are what we call polycrystalline. That means thousands and millions of crystals together with boundaries in between them. So here, for example, is, is an ordinary micrograph of a bit of nickel. And you can see a very large number of crystals packed together in such a way that they fill all space. There are no holes between them. And that's because they evolve from the liquid state and they touch each other and assume these shapes. Or you might have deformed the material and then you heat it up and the grains recrystallize and form a beautiful structure. So these, for example, are individual grains but a special kind of a grain which is known as an annealing twin that indicates that the material has been deformed and then recrystallized. And these arrows are simply pointing at the boundaries between crystals. And there's no course on crystallography, which would be complete without looking at aggregates of crystals, not <coughs> just single crystals. But we will come to that later after, uh, after learning about all the tools that are necessary to understand crystallography. So we will be dealing with uh, crystallography. And this is an ordinary micrograph. Okay? So you polish the sample, then you attack it with a chemical, and the chemical attacks different orientations differently. And if there are defects in your material, they attack more. So the boundaries are defects. So they form grooves when you attack with a chemical. And you shine light on it. The surfaces which are perfectly flat reflect it back, but others will reflect it away from your lens. And that's why you see the contrast. But from micrographs like this, you have no information about the crystallography. That means the orientation of each grain. So is there any technique that you can use which will show me the grains and the crystal orientation? Hmm? Yeah? So what, what does EBSD stand for? You're right. What, what, is the, uh, what is the meaning of EBSD? Diffraction. Yeah. So we will be dealing with uh, diffraction as well, which helps us to determine the orientation of the crystal. And nowadays, you know, images like this are extremely common where you not only have the grains, but the color there is a representation of how the grain is oriented in space. Okay? And you can do this on uh, routinely. Microscopes like this are available e almost everywhere nowadays. OK, so uh, let's think about crystals in more detail now. Uh, this is a beautiful pattern. And it's paper that you use to decorate the wall. Yeah? So we call it wallpaper. You don't use it very much in Korea, but this is very, very common in Europe, where you cover the walls with patterns. Uh, can you see, is this a very complicated pattern or a very simple pattern? Simple pattern. Hmm? Uh, and why do you say that? You're right. That's right. So there is a particular unit which we will identify. And that is all you need. You then just repeat that pattern many, 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 many times, and you generate the whole picture. So in this case, for example, this is what we call a unit cell. 
That means the basic cell, which if you repeat, you will generate the whole pattern. So if you had a, a stamp corresponding to that cell, you just go along like this, and you will reproduce the whole pattern. Okay? So that's called a unit cell, because the environment here, that means if I look in all directions about this point, is exactly the same as the environment here, here, and here. Okay? So this is a, a unit cell of this lattice, and if I repeat it, then I generate the whole pattern. Yeah. Now, notice uh, one thing. Uh, if I drew a triangle here, okay, would that be a good unit cell? Why? That's right. So, you know, if I, if I try to repeat triangles, there would be holes left in my pattern. Yeah? So, one condition for a unit cell is that it must be space filling. You cannot leave holes. Okay? So, every unit cell must be space filling. I could have defined a different unit cell. This is not a unique representation. I could actually go from here to here to here, that would be perfectly reasonable. But we tend to choose unit cells which have angles which are 90 degrees and the shortest, shortest uh, lengths, just for convenience, yeah, because those cells will nicely reflect the symmetry of the pattern. But the choice of a unit cell is, is arbitrary. So this is OK, yeah, because if I stack another one, it will fill space, but neither of these are unit cells because they do not fill space. Okay? Now, if I was manufacturing wallpaper, then I could only manufacture five different types of patterns. There are only five possible unit cells in two dimensions. But you can buy many, many kinds, right? So why is that? So I, I will show you the five different unit cells later, but there are only five possible patterns I can put which are periodic. So why is it that we can buy many different kinds of patterns? Yeah. So a unit cell is imaginary. Okay? It doesn't really exist, but I, uh, previously I drew a pattern like this. Now I'm drawing a pattern like this, so there isn't a unique choice. It's just in our mind. It's only when we start putting objects at the lattice points, the points which make the pattern, that it becomes a structure. Okay? So we'll come back to that later on. I can put a flower here. I can put a bee, and it will look different, but the lattice may be the same. The lattice type may be the same. Okay. Now here is a unit cell, and the way in which we describe the unit cell is by two vectors here, a1 and a2. We call those vectors the basis vectors, all right? And the magnitude of those vectors is the lattice parameter. And you can measure those lattice parameters using X-ray diffraction and so forth. And once you have defined these vectors, of course, the angles are also defined. But if you're not using vectors, then you would say, OK, the lattice parameter is A1 and A2, and the angle between the edges is, in this case, uh, 90 degrees. So that's the description of your unit cell in terms of the basis vectors, A1 and A2, or the lattice parameters a1, A2, and the angle between the edges of the cell. And these points are known as the lattice points. And the vectors here are known as lattice vectors if they start from a lattice point and end on another lattice point. Okay? So for example, this is also a lattice vector, but this is not. It doesn't end at a lattice point. Okay.
And once again, if I stack those lattice points on top of each other, then I generate the whole of the pattern. Now, we are mostly interested in three dimensions, although I'll give you a two-dimensional example later. Uh, there's nothing more complicated in three dimensions. We just have an additional basis vector A3. So we have three edges here, and these are our basis vectors, and these are the lattice points. Okay. Now, if all the lattice points are at the corners of the cell, then this is known as a primitive lattice. Primitive. lattice. And in that, there is only one lattice point per cell. One lattice point per cell. Now, why do I say there's only one lattice point per cell? I mean, I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Any ideas? Uh, we, we gotta divide each point in within the region. Yeah. The points are shared between neighbors and there are eight eight cells sharing one point if it's at a corner. So eight times one eight gives me one lattice point per cell, and that's called a primitive cell. Everyone happy with that? Okay, so let's just see what we have uh, learned. Uh, lattice points are defined by the fact that they have identical environments. That means if you look around each lattice point, you do not know where you are. Yeah? It looks exactly the same. Uh, a unit cell must fill space. Right? If it doesn't fill space, you can't generate the structure because there will be holes between the cell. Uh, we define it in terms of the basis vectors, you know, the vectors defining the edges of the cell. And the magnitudes of these vectors are the lattice parameters. There will be angles between A1, A2, between A2, A3, and A3, A1, which are conventionally referred to as alpha, beta, and gamma. And just like I explained that in two dimensions, there are only five different patterns. In three dimensions, there are only 14 different patterns, and these patterns we call the Brave lattices. Okay, I'll come, come to those shortly. So the key thing about a lattice point is that the environment at every lattice point is identical. Now, I've been talking generally about directions within crystals and so forth. Uh, we need to think about that a little bit more. So, Imagine that I have a cell here with the basis vectors A1 and A2, and I want to refer to this direction U, then it's very simple. You just treat U as if it's a vector. So here, U is equal to A1 plus A2. Right? So we write U as 1 along A1 and 1 along A2. And we use square brackets, because square brackets indicate directions. Later on, we'll look at planes in which case we use round brackets. And in three dimensions, it's straightforward. The components of the vector u along a1, a2, and a3 represent the Miller indices of that direction. Okay? So u1, u2, u3 is a direction in that unit cell. So the terms in brackets are simply the components of the vector along the basis vectors. Okay? Now, uh, what would the indices of this be? Let's assume it's going half along here. Right. So that's good. Um, I would have said one and half. Yeah. But we try to use integers. So this is equivalent to two, one a 2, 1 direction in this unit cell. Okay. So when we express directions, we try to use integers. There are certain directions which we call irrational, which means you can't express them as integers. But more often than not, 
you are using integral indices. Oops. Okay, so can somebody tell me the indices of this direction u? Say again. Someone said one bar one, right? Is that one bar one? <coughs> Is it one bar one? No, it isn't. That's u. It's going minus one along a one. So it's bar one, one, isn't it? Yeah? Everyone happy with that? Uh, yeah, 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 okay. So, so the indices are minus one and one, but we write that as bar one and one. Okay? Hmm. How about uh, this direction, U? Yeah, somebody said two, one because it's going 2 along A1 and 1 along A2. So it's very simple. The Miller indices are simply given by the components of the vector along the cell edges. Right, so let's do it in three dimensions. What is this vector here? 1, 1, 1. It's the body diagonal here, if this is cubic. Yeah? It goes 1 along there, 1 along there, and 1 here. How about this one? Yeah, so it's not going anything along A1. It's going 1 along there and 1. So that's 0, 1, 1. Okay, now we have a, a slight problem, uh, and that is as follows. So imagine that we have a cubic cell. It's a primitive cubic cell. So P, the symbol P stands for primitive cubic. That means we only have lattice points at the corners of the cell. The, which directions are these? On here? So 1, 0, 0. Where is 1, 0, 0? Yeah, it's the edge of this cube. And similarly, all of these are the edges of the cube. Yeah, there are six, uh, six edges, and here are six directions. Now, of course, whether I label this as 1, 0, 0 or 0, 1, 0 depends on my choice of basis vectors, right? But there is no physical difference between those directions. It's simply a matter of choosing your coordinate axes, right? If I measure the thermal expansion coefficient along 1, 0, 0, it'll be exactly the same as along 0, 1, 0 or bar 1, 0, 0. Yeah, if I measure the modulus, it'll be exactly the same. So this is what we call crystallographically equivalent directions. Okay. That means the behavior along those directions is precisely the same, the atomic arrangement, the distance between atoms, and so forth. And sometimes we don't want to refer to a specific direction, but we want to say that along directions like these, the modulus is 80 gigapascals. Okay. So instead of using square brackets, if you use brackets like these, that implies not one zero zero direction, but all these directions, all equivalent directions. So you say the modulus along one zero zero with these brackets is eighty gigapascals. So this is expressing the fact that all of these are crystallographically equivalent. So the nature of the brackets you use is important. If you refer to one zero zero, then we are specifically referring to this direction. So you might be pulling your crystal along that axis. It's perfectly acceptable once you've defined the coordinates to say I'm pulling it along specifically 1, 0, 0, in which case you use square brackets. But if you want to say the modulus along the cube edges is 80 gigapascals, then you would use this form of brackets. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Yep. Now, uh, Miller indices. So Miller was actually in Cambridge University in the Earth Sciences Department. Okay. And he defined uh, how we use Miller indices. And he also came up with a scheme for planes, which 
when I introduce it to you, it will seem a little bit strange. But later on, as we go through the lectures, you'll realize that a plane normal is a vector, but in reciprocal space, not in real space. Okay? So just, just accept what I say today and learn the method, and then you will understand it later. So the way we refer to the indices of a plane is, let's say this is the plane. We look at the intercept along A1, and the intercept is 1. Along A2, the intercept is 1. And along A3, the intercept is a half. Right? Everyone happy with that? You then take the reciprocal of those intercepts. So 1 divided by 1 is just 1. Half divided by, oh, sorry, 1 divided by half is 2. And these are the Miller indices for that plane. So this is the 1, 1, 2 plane. Okay? So first you find the indices, and then you take its reciprocal. Uh, sorry, first you find the intercepts, and then one upon that intercept gives you the Miller indices of the plane. Okay? So we take the reciprocal of the intercepts. And of course, uh, if we had to, we convert them into integers. And the brackets that you use to refer to a specific plane are the round brackets drawn over there. Okay. Okay, so which plane is this? Yeah, because the intercepts are one on one, and the reciprocal of the intercepts obviously gives us one on one, right? How about this? What are the intercepts first? <laughs> so you know, if you have two things which are parallel, and you extend them to infinity, they'll touch each other. Yeah. yeah? Is, is that right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, in mathematics, yeah? yeah. So the intercept on uh, A1 is infinity. Uh, on A2 is 1. and infinity. So if I take the reciprocal of that, then 0, 1, 0. Okay? Is everyone happy with that? So that is uh, our 0, 1, 0 plane. Okay, how about this? Zero one one. That's right, because the, again, there's no intercept on the x-axis, so we have infinity. Then it cuts at one and one, so the Miller indices are zero one one. Okay. There you go. Zero one one. So very good. We've learned how to refer to planes and directions, but just like we had the crystallographically equivalent directions, we also have crystallographically equivalent plane. So every face of that cube, for example, has exactly the same properties, right? So, you know, a 1, 0, 0 plane will also ha be exactly the same as a 0, 1, 0 plane or a 0, 0, bar 1 plane. So we need a method to refer to crystallographically equivalent planes. So imagine that we have, uh, we are thinking about the 1, 1, 1 plane. We have 1, 1, 1, we have 1, 1, bar 1, 1, bar 1, 1, and bar 1, 1, 1. And you can take the negatives of these as well. Okay? They are all exactly identical in terms of the atomic structure and properties. So to refer, so these are common slip planes actually in cubic metals. The 1, 1, 1 plane is a, is a slip plane or a slip direction. And when we talk about the slip plane for austenite, it's usually, we say it's a 1, 1, 1 plane, not specifically 1, 1, 1, but the crystallographically equivalent set, which we refer to by these curly brackets. Okay? So when we use curly brackets, that means I'm referring generally to 1, 1, 1 planes, not to a particular plane, 1, 1, 1, which I happen to have loaded. 
Now, supposing that I have a plane HKL, how many possible equivalent planes are there in a cubic system? Uh, no, HKL. So it could be, say, one, two, three. So just like here, I, I did one, 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 one bar, one, one bar, one, one, and so on. What if it was one, two, three? How many could I generate? Hmm? Twenty-four. Okay. Let me see if I can derive that. Okay. So we have one, two, three. One, three, two, three, two, one, and so on. Can you do that? Yeah? It'll take me a long time to go through all 24. <laughs> and of course, use the bar as well as a differentiator. Yeah? And you'll see that there are 24 possible variants of the 1, 2, 3 plane in a cubic system. Okay? Now, we are going to deal in the future with quite complicated structures, all right? So, you know, the cementite unit cell, for example, has a very large number of atoms in it. You know, we need to be able to think with clarity rather than draw three-dimensional structures. So I'm going to show you an easy way of representing three-dimensional structures. So here, for example, is a body-centered cubic cell, right? So all the edges are of equal length, uh, but in addition to the lattice points at the corner, I also have a lattice point <coughs> in the middle, right? So this is no longer a primitive cell. We have two lattice points per cell, you know, the one-eighth coming from the corners and one in the middle. Now, if I just project this along the z-axis, then it's very simple. Uh, I have lattice points at 0 and 1. There's no need to label them. If they are at 0 and 1, it's understood. And we have a lattice point at a half height. And the other coordinates are simply half and half along here. Okay. So this is a projection of the structure along the z-axis. It's a lot, lot simpler than trying to draw a three-dimensional cell. Okay. Is everyone happy how to draw that projection? Okay, so if I wanted to do this for a face-centered cubic cell, right? So instead of the body center, I have a lattice point at the center of each face. Then what would it look like? Projection. Okay, can you tell me where to draw the points? Every corner, and I don't need to label them because they are at naught and one. Is that complete for the zero and one? Hmm? Yeah? Somebody said something. Yeah, yeah. So we should have one over here because that's the face at the top and bottom which also has uh, a lattice point, yeah? What else is missing? Yeah. Uh, so here, and I need to write half, right? Because it's at a half height. And similarly, here, and here, and here. Yeah, so it's much easier to visualize things in two dimensions than trying to draw a cell in three dimensions because I could put a complicated set of atoms at each lattice point, yeah? and that would make it impossible for you to visualize it properly in three dimensions. So here is our face centered cubic unit cell, and you can see that you know this is not really worth spending time on. This is very, very easy. Okay? So structure projections are much easier to handle than three-dimensional diagrams. 
Now, I've talked about body-centered cubic, so that's one of the cells, the Brave lattices, and what would I call this if it's a cube? Primitive cubic cell. Okay. And in the case of a cubic system, there are only three possible Brave lattices. Uh, the primitive cubic, this is now a projection, the face-centered cubic, which we drew on the board, and this is the body-centered cubic. And the symbol for body-centered cubic is I, because it comes from the German, okay? But it means body-centered. So cubic I means body-centered cubic, cubic F means face-centered cubic, and um, cubic P is primitive. So those are the three possible unit cells for a cubic lattice. And I've already talked a little bit about symmetry. Uh, I'll just very briefly introduce you to symmetry. There are different kinds of symmetries. So translational symmetry is what we described for the lattice points, that if I go from one lattice point to the other lattice point, it exactly, uh, appears exactly the same. So from here to here to here, it's exactly identical environment. Okay, so that's called translational symmetry. Uh, this is a four-fold <coughs> axis of rotation. So if I rotate about this axis by 90 degrees, then I reproduce what's already there. Yeah? So this we refer to as a tetrad. That means a four-fold axis, rotation axis of symmetry. And this is a mirror plane. So here's an object, and it reflects exactly into an object on the other side. So we have mirror planes, we have rotation axes, and we have translation. Without translational symmetry, we would not have a crystal, right? Now, there is also a more complicated uh, symmetry element, and that's called a center of symmetry. That means if I start from a location here and invert every point through the center of the cell, then I would obtain an object like this, okay? So if I take any point and I invert it through the center, I would find a corresponding point on the other side. So not all crystals have centers of symmetry. So for example, uh, you know, the piezoelectric crystals. Yeah, do you know what a piezoelectric crystal is? Yeah, if you hit it, then you get a spark, right? So you know, uh, I assume that none of you are smoking, but if you are smoking, you may be using a lighter in which the spark is generated by hitting a crystal. So crystals with those properties don't have a center of symmetry. We'll come to that later. Now, in addition to the rotation axes and the mirror plane, we have elements which combine rotation or reflection with translation. So here, for example, is uh, our normal fourfold rotation axis. But this is what we call a screw axis, okay? So that means you rotate, in this case, it's a dyad. That means a two-fold rotation by 180 degrees. If I, if I rotate by 180 degrees and then translate by a fraction of the lattice vector, okay? So here, the lattice vector is this, because look, if I go from here to here, there's no change, right? If I rotate by 180 degrees and translate by half the lattice vector, then there is an object here which I reproduce. So this is called a screw diode. So I rotate and I translate, just like uh, you know a screw. So you can have you know a screw tetrad and so on. Similarly, with a mirror plane, I can reflect and then translate by a fraction of the lattice vector. So again, the lattice vector is this distance. If I reflect it and then translate by half, then I reproduce this object here. So this is called a glide plane. Okay? Now, obviously, these translations are very small. You know, they're a fraction of a lattice vector. So when we are looking <coughs> at a macroscopic object, we do not detect them. Yeah? So macroscopically, we cannot see these translations. But if you look at the properties of the crystals, we know that it's not actually a mirror plane, but it's a glide plane or a screw axis. I'll give you examples of this later on. 
So when you look at crystals, you know, and a lot of crystallography was just derived by looking at crystals and the shapes of crystals, you don't detect the translational elements of symmetry. So these 14 Bravais lattices, just like uh, the cubic part, we have three different cells, uh, can be divided into seven crystal classes, which are, are given over here. So we have the cubic, and here we have the cubic uh, I, the cubic P, and the cubic F. And the <coughs> defining symmetry, that means unless you have that symmetry, it's not a cubic, is that we have four triads. Triads are threefold axes of symmetry. Right? So I rotate by 120 degrees, 120 and 120. So where in the cube do you have a triad, a threefold axis? body diagonal. So you go from one corner to the opposite corner, you turn by 120 degrees, it appears the same, the cube appears the same. Okay? It's hard to visualize, isn't it? There are movies on my website that I gave you, where you can turn it through 120 degrees and see that you will reproduce the cube. Okay? So there are four body diagonals. Right? So if you do not have four triads, in, when you look at the crystal and you cannot find four triads, it cannot be cubic. So the defining symmetry for a cubic system is four triads. Okay? So just by looking at a crystal, uh, which is, has its equilibrium shape, if you cannot find four such axes, it cannot be cubic. Similarly, if you have a hexagonal crystal, there will be a one axis where you rotate by you know, um, a six-fold axis of rotation. If that is missing, then it cannot be a hexagonal unit cell, okay. and, and so on. All right? Now, this is best taught using examples, and we will do those examples uh, as we go along in the lecture. But there is a certain minimum symmetry that you must have in order to be compatible with a particular kind of unit cell, and this is defining the minimum symmetry that you need. And for a cube, it's four triads. That means four body diagonals, which are threefold axes of rotation. Okay? Right, so in three dimensions, these are the 14 possible patterns that we can have, which have long-range periodicity. So we have uh, the three different kinds of cubic crystals, P, F, and I. We have uh, trigonal, hexagonal, and tetragonal, orthorhombic, and these are the lowest symmetry, monoclinic and triclinic. And again, it's quite difficult to visualize some of these. So it's better to use structure projections, which makes it a, a lot simpler. All of these diagrams and so on are in the comprehensive notes which you can download from this website. And it might be worth printing them out for your own reference because that is what those are written specifically for this course. Yeah. So these are the structure projections for the 14 Brave lattices. And there are no more than 14 if you have long-range periodicity. Okay? So every material that we know will fall in one of these categories. Of course, we are interested in iron, and the most common forms of iron. Yeah? So we produce about 1.3 billion tons of iron every year, and almost all of that will be body-centered cubic, <coughs> which we commonly call that ferrite. And if we are at high temperatures, then we will have the face-centered cubic or austenite. Is there any other form of iron that you know about? So these are the commonest allotropes. That means it's pure iron, yeah? And different crystal structures in pure iron. We have the body-centered cubic and the face-centered cubic. Any other form that you know about? Hmm? Sorry? HCP, yeah. <laughs> Hexagonal closed packed. If you look at the phase diagram for pure iron, okay, so uh, there's no carbon or anything here, 
and we are plotting temperature versus pressure, then the body-centered cubic iron is stable at room temperature and at very high temperature. So delta is the same as alpha, okay. it's body-centered cubic. Uh, as you raise the temperature, you can get austenite uh, for, for normal pressures. Okay. So here, for example, is 910 degrees centigrade. If I heat at uh, normal pressure is one bar, you know, then I will get my face-centered cubic structure. But if the pressure is high, then both alpha and gamma transform into hexagonal closed pack. It's a very, very large pressure, about 130,000 atmospheres of pressure. Now, what does that tell you about the density of epsilon compared with the density of ferrite or austenite? Hmm? As I increase the pressure, epsilon is favored, hexagonal. What does that tell you about the density of epsilon relative to ferrite or austenite? Hmm? Yeah, it's a higher density. Yeah? That's surprising because you thought that austenite had the highest density, but actually epsilon is the highest density form of iron. And if you go, if you look at the movie, you know, Journey to the Center of the Earth, they got it a little bit wrong. Because right in the middle, we have solid hexagonal closed packed iron. Because even though the temperature is very high, the pressure is high enough to make the liquid unstable. And you have a large, uh, possibly huge crystal. Yeah, because it's been roasting for many, many thousands of years of hexagonal closed packed iron, followed by liquid, and then followed by the slag, you know, that you create in a blast furnace. So we are living actually on several thousand kilometers of slag, yeah, the oxides which result from the creation of the iron in the middle. How do we know this is hexagonal closed packed? Well, you can send waves through the earth longitudinal and transverse waves, and by looking at how they behave, you can decide that it's hexagonal closed pack, or you can do calculations. Uh, calculations to see what form of iron should be stable. <coughs> now, what is the disadvantage of a hexagonal closed pack structure? Can anybody, we will learn a bit more about this, but you know, there are many people in this uh, university studying magnesium. Magnesium is hexagonal closed pack. What is the big disadvantage? Uh, it has very low flexibility. Right, and why is that? Yeah, so in a hexagonal closed pack system, uh, you can only slip, uh, not completely true, all right? But you can only slip on the basal plane, the, the horizontal plane. In a cubic system, you have so many slip systems that the material is ductile. So we have to be very thankful that the stable form of iron on top of the earth is ferrite. If it was hexagonal closed packed iron, we wouldn't have civilization at all. Okay. Just imagine if you take all your iron out from here and treat it like magnesium, what would your life be like? And the reason is very interesting. Um, is to do with the electronic structures. If you look at this row of the periodic table, you have iron, ruthenium, and osmium. They are all have the same outer electron configuration. So they are, they are chemically they behave like <coughs> iron, ruthenium, and osmium. But these are larger atoms. Okay? That means if you make a crystal structure out of them, they will be spaced further apart. And if they are spaced further apart, then you don't get ferromagnetism. Okay? You know, you need interactions, certain interactions, in order to produce ferromagnetism, which has all the spins uh, aligned. Right? It's the ferromagnetism which makes the body-centered cubic structure of iron stable. These are hexagonal closed packed, ruthenium and osmium. So we have absolutely everything to thank iron for, 
for being ferromagnetic. If it is not ferromagnetic, it would be hexagonal closed back. Okay. 